Welcome back. It's good to be back with you again, sharing some of God's word as we grow together with our Lord Jesus Christ as we meet him in our word. Our uh, goal here is to, to grow tall with Jesus Christ as we um, work with him in his word. These devotions are designed to do that. This is part of a series that'll kind of reflect on Lent a little bit. And we're starting today in John chapter 13, which is what, what John is going to describe when he's in the upper room with, with the Lord Jesus. Um, I am Paul Went. I'm the Director of Christian Education at St. John Lutheran Church in Kendallville, Indiana, if you don't know who I am. Glad to be with you in this way. Our passage starts this way. Now, before the feast of the Passover, when Jesus knew that his hour had come to depart out of this world to the Father, having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. Jesus knows that within hours, he'll be on trial. Within hours, he'll be beaten, abused, mocked, whipped, and ultimately crucified and will die. He will suffer for the sin of the world. He knows this as he gathers with his disciples. Even though he has told his disciples at least three times that this is going to happen, the disciples simply can't believe it. They don't believe it. But Jesus knows. And so what is he going to do? He's going to prepare them and protect them to a degree, even from their own unbelief, by showing them how much he loves them. He's going to show them that his love has no limits. After the resurrection, after Pentecost, when the Holy Spirit comes, all of this will make complete sense to them as they begin to share the gospel message. And that understanding will continue to grow throughout their lives. Just as with us, sometimes we're not exactly sure how much Jesus loves us. And yet as we examine these events, we too will see how much he loves you and me. The passage continues. During supper, when the devil had already put into the heart of Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, to betray him, Jesus, knowing that the father had given all things into his hand, and that he had come from God and was going back to God, rose from supper. He laid aside his outer garments and taking a towel, tied it around his waist. Then he poured water into a basin and began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with the towel that was wrapped around him. Jesus knows that God has given him everything in his hands, everything in his power. And in one of the future devotions, we'll kind of look at an expression of that. He's got the authority. He's got the power. He's actually the one that's in charge of all of these events. He's in control. So what is Jesus doing? In the first century, most people got from one place to another by walking. Most of the roads, even if they were paved, were very dirty. Animals shared the same roads, so you can begin to imagine what's on the roads. In cities, if people had water that they used for washing or whatever, they had to get rid of it somewhere. That often went out into the street. A curious... Um, 
historical fact is the original sidewalks were a Roman invention. And these were things that were raised on the side of streets so you didn't have to walk in the nastiness of the streets, be that as it may. Not available in Jerusalem, streets were too narrow. In every good house in the first century in Judea, there would be a slave at the door to wash your feet. So as you came in off these dirty, dusty roads that had all sorts of other things on them, your feet would be washed. In the first century, to recline at a table literally meant that the tables were maybe 12 or 14 inches off of the ground. There were cushions around them. You would lay back into the cushion and tuck your feet under the table. Well, your feet were often tucked under the table about the place where your neighbor was reclining on the cushion. You can begin to imagine. As the disciples enter this room for what we call the Last Supper, there's no slave at the door. This actually was considered the most menial task available. This was the lowest of the low jobs in the first century. Nobody wanted to do it. And ultimately, all of these disciples walk in and it's like, well, not me, not me, not me, not me. And so they're at table with dirty feet. And here's Jesus. He takes that form of the lowest servant. Why? To demonstrate to these disciples, these men, this is how much I love you. Jesus loves us that much. He serves us willingly gladly. Let's move on. He came to Simon Peter, who said to him, Lord, do you wash my feet? Jesus answered him, what I am doing, you do not understand now, but afterward you will understand. Peter said to him, you shall never wash my feet. Jesus answered him, if I do not wash you, you have no share with me. The relationship with Peter that Jesus has is fascinating. Peter is always ready to jump in with both feet and sometimes does so in a way that gets him into trouble. Sometimes Peter speaks before he thinks. You always know where Peter stands because he's going to be right there. And Jesus loves Peter enough to embrace him just where he is. He loves Peter enough to enjoy his presence. He loves Peter enough to love him in a way that begins to bring about mature, maturity and growth in Peter. And this is part of that. Jesus even says to him, you don't understand it right now. I know it makes no sense to you that I'm doing the lowest of the low servant jobs. I am doing what the lowest slaves I'll try to get out of. You'll understand it. If you don't let me do it, though, you're rejecting my love. And that's really what it is. So it's a complex relationship with Peter. So how does Peter handle this? Simon Peter says to him, says to Jesus, Lord, not my feet only, but my hands and my head. You kind of catch Peter like, okay, I went all in one way and that didn't work so good. So now I'm going all in the other way. Jesus said to him, the one who has bathed does not need to wash except for his feet, but is completely clean. And you are clean, but not every one of you. We'll get to that in a minute. Jesus is trying to help Peter clarify what's happening. I'm showing you this act of love by doing a very menial task. I'm doing what the task requires. 
It doesn't require me to wash your head and your hands. Those are already clean. And in many respects, as we live that life of walking with Jesus, when we walk through the messiness of our own sinfulness and the messiness of our own life, we have been sanctified. We have been washed by the shed blood of Jesus. We don't need our head and our hands washed. We need to clean up the mess that we just made, that we just walked through. That's that life of forgiveness. That's that life of repentance, receiving the forgiveness of Jesus, and then receiving his grace and his power to walk new in that new life he's given us. So it's not just about Peter here in the upper room. It's about you and me, too. It's about our walk with Jesus. It's about recognizing that every day I make messes that I walk through and I got dirty feet that need to be cleaned. And Jesus graciously will do that. But he's not going to do it on our terms. Peter's trying to say, hey, Lord, here's my terms. And Jesus says, no, no, this is what's happening. I am here to show you genuine, godly love. And you can't dictate how that looks. You can only receive it. So let's pick up that phrase again. And you are clean, but not every one of you. For he knew who was to betray him. And that's why he said, not all of you are clean. Jesus knew that Judas Iscariot would betray him. Jesus knew that the devil had so filled Judas's heart that Judas's eyes were closed to who Jesus really is. And yet Jesus still loved him. This was kind of a way of saying, I still love you. I'm still reaching out to you. Actually, later in this very meal, if you read John closely, he picks up a piece of bread in the middle of the table and he offers it to Judas in response to a question of, Lord, who's going to betray you? And ultimately, as that happens, um, Jesus is honoring Judas. In the traditional Passover meal of the first century, there would be a piece of unleavened bread in the center of the table that belonged to the host. Jesus was the host. If the host wanted to honor someone at the table, the host would break a piece of that bread off, dip it in the sauce, and then hand it to that person. It was a sign of high honor. Jesus is showing Judas he loves him, even though he knows right now Judas is not responding to that love. And ultimately, sadly, Judas never does. Jesus continues to reach out with that kind of sacrificial, non-judgmental, giving love to everyone in the world. Sadly, many will not respond. We thank and praise God that we have. And we pray for those that we know who may not have up to this point. Well, how does this come out? When he had washed their feet and put on his outer garments and resumed his place, he said to them, do you understand what I have done for you? Probably not. He goes on, you call me teacher and Lord, and you are right, for so I am. Jesus here asserts all of the authority God has given him as teacher and Lord. This is who he is. This is who I am. I have not rele released or relinquished any little bit of that. I am still all of that and more than you can possibly know. He then says, if I then your Lord and teacher have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. Wow. Wow. That's not just the disciples in the room. That's me. That's you. We are called to live as a Christ-like servant leader. We are called to live as those who serve others, as the Holy Spirit directs, not as they direct. 
We live in a culture where people will say, I want this, I want that, I want the other thing. And some of that's legitimate and some of it isn't. That's another conversation. We are called to follow the Holy Spirit and serve people, even if they're ungrateful, even if they, you know, demand more than we're willing to give or are led to give by the Holy Spirit. We are called to serve people, not for their harm but for their good. And how do we know that? By staying closely and tightly connected to Jesus and the Holy Spirit. So that as we serve sacrificially, as we do feet, as we wash feet, we do so as God's dearly loved children. And it is done in a way that points that other person to the Lord Jesus Christ and all that he has for them. Jesus goes on, for I have given you an example that you should do just as I have done to you. Truly, truly, I say to you, a servant is not greater than his master, nor is a messenger greater than the one who sent him. If you know these things, blessed are you if you do them. This is our calling. It's not a calling necessarily to just a comfortable life where no one bothers us. It's a calling to a life of willingness to serve as the Lord Jesus leads us. And it can be as simple as a parent taking care of a child or one spouse taking care of another. Or it can be as complex as dealing with someone who is really in need and really is a mess because people are often messy. Truth be told, we're sinners. We're often messy too. We are called to live as Jesus did, not as a command, not as an obligation, but as a free and loving response to his salvation that he has worked in us. And that's what he's saying here. I'm your teacher and Lord. I'm the one who died for you. I'm the one who rose again. I'm the one who made you alive spiritually when you were dead. I'm the one who gives you and sustains that spiritual life. I am the one who gives you gifts. I'm the one who pours my love into you beyond measure, my compassion beyond measure. I forgive you all of your sin and give you the ability to forgive others as well. And I want you to go out there and live that way. What a challenge. What a challenge. Jesus does that to bless us and to, so that we can experience his joy. He also does that so that we reach others with him, which is the other half of our mission statement. We grow tall in Christ to reach all with Christ. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we thank and praise you that you gave us this amazing example in the upper room so many years ago. And it wasn't just for those disciples gathered there. It also was for us. You serve us as you serve them. Graciously, lovingly, humbly. You fill us with your love, with your peace, with your strength, and invite us to go and serve in the same way. Help us each, Lord Jesus, to understand what it is you are calling us to do and to graciously and gladly do it. We ask you, Lord Jesus, that you would continue to help us to reach out with the good news that you came, you died, you were buried, you rose again from the dead, and you now live forever. And you call people to yourself as the Savior and Lord. Help us to share that message so that many more may come to know you, as Lord and Savior, and that those of us who do might encourage one another with that good news. We lift that up in Jesus' name. Amen. Good to be with you. Uh, Pastor and I at St. John Lutheran are here to talk with you, to pray with you. Uh, if you are seeing this devotion because you found it on the internet or a friend shared it with you or whatever, um, and you're not sure how to do that, go to sjlc.net and click on the contact tab. We would love to have a conversation with you. Recognize that if you're in the Kendallville, Indiana area, we are worshiping in person at 7 p.m. 
uh, Thursday evening at 8 and 10.30 a.m. on Sunday morning. We have Bible study at 9.15 uh, between those services and uh, would be glad to have you join us for any of those things. It is once again good to be with you in this format. I pray that these devotions may be strengthening for you, may help you grow in your faith, may encourage you in your walk with our Lord Jesus Christ. Good to be with you once again. Till next time.